So good afternoon, everyone. Wow, awesome, welcome. I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator, and thank you all sincerely for being here um, for Lunch Poems' 22nd kickoff event. We also like to thank the University Library for hosting this event here in the Morrison Library. I invite you all to sign up on our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk. Also on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you can view this reading and all of our past readings on YouTube where we have our very own channel. Next month on October 5th, uh, join us for a reading by poet Laylee Long Soldier. So do please come back and join us. Now, welcome uh, Lunch Poems director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce today's stellar lineup of guests. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, and I also want to thank Giovanni um, for all of the work in Visible and Visible that happens to schedule these events and to put them on, as well as to our undergraduate volunteers over there. Um, I love this event. Um, it's one that has become a part of those 22 years, um, a tradition in which we see the far-flung scatter plot of poetry suddenly temporarily reconsolidated, and we see how poetry lives, how it persists in the lives of those who foolishly didn't dedicate their entire lives to it. Um, but as I talk about poetry living and persisting, I also want to take this moment to mark the passing of a giant of American poetry, John Ashbery, who was 68 years older than Lunch Poems, when he died um, on Sunday morning at four in the morning. And I'm gonna sneak in a poem by him before we begin with the ones chosen by the people reading today um, in order to bring his presence further into this room. It's called Just Walking Around and it's from a book called A Wave. What name do I have for you? Certainly there is no name for you in the sense that the stars have names that somehow fit them. Just walking around an object of curiosity to some, but you are too preoccupied by the secret smudge in the back of your soul to say much and wander around, smiling to yourself and others. It gets to be kind of lonely, but at the same time off-putting, counterproductive, as you realize once again that the longest way is the most efficient way, the one that looped among islands, and you always seem to be traveling in a circle. And now that the end is near, the segments of the trip swing open like an orange. There is light in there and mystery and food. Come see it. Come not for me, but it. But if I am still there, grant that we may see each other. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce the first reader, and then I'll spring up temporarily in between each reading to introduce the following reader. Our first reader today is Adam Hillier, um, Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions. He has an eclectic background in education, event management, and photography. Please ask him about it, Daring. He joined UC Berkeley in 2014 and oversees the systems team for the office. Adam holds a credential in project management, an MA in higher education administration from Santa Clara University, and a BFA in studio art from the University of Arizona. Please welcome the many-lettered Adam Hillier. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, when I received the invitation to read a favorite poem, I tried to think back through my high school and college years, and none were quite my favorite as much as when I was six years old, and my parents gave me a Valentine's Day present of a book, If I Were in Charge of the World and Other Worries by Judith Viorst. And they've written in it in 1984, which is why I know exactly when they gave it to me. For Adam on Valentine's Day, love mommy and daddy. So there's many favorites in here, and I have just selected one. Teddy bear poem. I threw away my teddy bear, the one that lost his eye. I threw him in the garbage pail. I thought I heard him cry. I've had that little teddy bear since I was only two. But I'm much bigger now, and I've got better things to do. 
then play with silly teddy bears. And so I said goodbye and threw him in the garbage pail. Who's crying, he or I? Thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is Khalid Kadir, who's a continuing lecturer at UC Berkeley, who teaches courses in political economy, um, the Global Poverty and Practice Program, and the College of Engineering. To that end, he spends much of his time and energy exploring ways to combine community-engaged scholarship with classroom learning, and how to train future engineers to engage with the social and political roots of their technical work. His current research focuses on engineering pedagogy, the political economy of public higher education, and the design of water and sanitation systems in humanitarian contexts. Khalid Kadir. It was really sort of exciting for me to be invited to this, because not many people in the professional space know that I grew up reading poetry. Um, and I, like, Freshman year of college was deciding, do I study English literature or do I study engineering? As an 18-year-old, I told this, engineer, this English professor that, well, I need a job. And she was done with me as of that moment. Uh, I haven't let go of poetry. Uh, and, and given the sort of political times we're in, I, I wanted to, I struggled to choose what to read today, as I'm sure all of us have. I wanted to read something I felt more connected to. So I've chosen a poem by someone who I love very much, a friend of mine, his name is Amir Suleiman. He's a poet, uh, he's a spoken word poet as well, and I'm gonna read a spoken word piece of his. I will be reading it, he would perform it. Uh, he's from Rochester, he now lives in Oakland. The title of the poem is Like a Thief in the Night. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. They say the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Perhaps the Lord will come in the things that I write, in the things that we bleed, in the things that we read, in the things we recite. Maybe they're afraid I'll spit fire and these kerosene streets will ignite, or that I'll spit water and these barren streets will give life. And I've learned a thing that pulls the fiend to the pipe is the same thing that pulls a human being to the light, the love of love, a means to cope. So I try to inhale their dreams and exhale hope. Homeboy said, man, the people either feel it or don't. So you can't inhale their dreams and exhale hope, but you better chew coca leaves and spit out dope. And that reminded me of a passage, and I quote, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change the condition of what is within themselves, end quote. Inshallah, I won't falter. Steady rock of Gibraltar. Swift traverse in waters, verses I've authored, I offer as a solemn sacrifice upon the altar in order to alter the conditions of our sons and our fathers. And they say we need more black mayors and black lawyers. I say we, meet, we need more black John Mayers to win Grammys for singing songs about our daughters because we are caught in a culture of defeatism, worshiping victims and martyrs. Our brilliance, our resilience, and our beauty is farther than pimp and hose, trick and dope, Gucci and Prada. From Sayo Street to Simpson Road, we are shook in the trauma of terrorism that precedes Al-Qaeda and Osama. Forget bin Laden, Ben Franklin enslaved my great-great-grandmama, comma, great-great-grandfather, comma, indigenous nations off reservations, comma, but we caught in a coma, sleep. So the truth will have to come like a thief in the night. But if you're awake, you'll hear it in the things that we write, in the things that we bleed, in the things we recite. And because the truth will come like a thief in the night, being awake, I've learned, is the meaning of life. Just let that settle for a second. Okay, our next reader is Marco Lindsay, who's the Chief of Staff at the Haas School of Business. He's worked on campus for the past decade, and he's an Oakland native. Most recently, he received the Chancellor's Outstanding Staff Award for the diversity work that he does on campus and in the community. Marco Lindsay. Well, thank you all for having me here. This is a wonderful thing for us to be doing on campus, and I'm glad that it's been continuing on, and I'm pretty sure it will continue on. The poem I'm going to read is called There It Is. It's by a woman named Jane Cortez. <clears throat> My friend, they don't care if you're an individualist, a leftist, a rightist, a shithead, or a snake. They will try to exploit you, 
absorb you, confine you, disconnect you, isolate you, or kill you. And you'll disappear into your own rage, into your own insanity, into your own poverty, into a word, a phrase, a slogan, a cartoon, and then ashes. The ruling class will tell you there is no ruling class as they organize their liberal supporters in the right white supremacist lynch mobs, organize their children into Ku Klux Klan gangs, organize their police into killer cops, organize their propaganda into a device to ossify us with angel dust, preoccupy us with Western symbols and African hairstyles, inoculate us with hate, institutionalize us with ignorance, hypnotize us with a monotonous sound designed to make us evade reality and stomp our lives away. And we're programmed to self-destruct to fragment, to get buried under covert intelligence operations of unintelligent committees impulse towards death. And there it is. The enemies polishing their penises between oil wells at the Pentagon, the bulldozers, bulldozers leaping into demolition dances, the old folks dying of starvation, the informers wearing out shoes looking for crumbs, the lifeblood of the earth almost dead and greedy mouth of imperialism. And my friend, they don't care if you're an individualist, a leftist, a rightist, a shithead, or a snake. They will spray you with the virus of Legionnaire's disease, fill your nostrils with swine flu of their arrogance, stuff your body into a tampon of toxic shock syndrome, try to pump all the resources of the world into their own veins, and fly off into the wild blue yonder to pollute yet another planet. And if we don't fight, if we don't resist, if we don't organize and unify and get the power to control our own lives, then we will wear the exaggerated look of captivity, the stylized look of submission, the bizarre look of suicide, the dehumanized look of fear, the decomposed look of repression forever and ever and ever. And there it is. Thank you. And here we are. Our next reader is Kathy Mendonca, who's a proud mom of three boys and grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, moved to California to attend UC Riverside, where she received degrees in psychology and sociology. She began her UC career in 2001 and joined the UC Berkeley campus in 2009. A 2016 COSA award recipient, Kathy is currently a senior instructional design and learning specialist in central HR learning and development. In this role, she cultivates her professional passion for empowering others to achieve the greatest impact in their own areas of expertise. Kathy Mendoza. Thank you, it's an honor to be here today. The poem I'm gonna to read to you, the first time I read it, I was in the eighth grade, and it was a big assignment to go try to discover more poetry, and I read and read and couldn't find anything I liked, and then all of a sudden I came upon this, and it was the first piece of poetry that I ever fell in love with. Um, it's, to me, it's about a person who's plagued with pain and loss in their life, and then they become soothed when they go to sleep at night, and then they dream about a mystical place that's filled with strange and amazing sights and ghosts and memories from their past. So um, today what I'm going to read to you is called Dreamland, and it's by Edgar Allan Poe, and it was published in 1844. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an idolin named Night on a black throne reigns upright, I have reached these lands but newly from an ultimate dim Thule, from a wild, weird climb that lieth sublime out of space, out of time. Bottomless veils and boundless floods and chasms and caves and titan woods with forms that no man can discover for the tears that drip all over. Mountains toppling evermore into seas without a shore, seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire. Lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their still waters, still and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the lakes that thus outspread their lone waters, lone and dead, their sad waters, sad and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the mountains near the river, murmuring lowly, murmuring ever, by the gray woods, by the swamp, where the toad and the newt encamp, 
by the dismal tarns and pools where dwell the ghouls, by each spot the most unholy, in each nook most melancholy, there the traveler meets aghast sheeted memories of the past, shrouded forms that start and sigh as they pass the wanderer by, white-robed forms of friends long given in agony to the earth and heaven. For the heart whose woes are legion, tis a peaceful, soothing region. For the spirit that walks in shadow, tis, oh, tis an El Dorado. But the traveler traveling through it may not, dare not openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed. So wills its king who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid. And thus the sad soul that here passes beholds it but through darkened glasses. By a route obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an idol and named night on a black throne reigns upright, I have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim Thule. Our next reader seems to have found a way to keep poetry in her professional life. Claudia Polsky is an assistant clinical professor and director of the Environmental Law Clinic at Berkeley Law. As a reader and writer, she prefers poetry to law review articles. And then in parens, in parens it says, shh. She has been a volunteer teacher of poetry in Berkeley Public Schools and is designing a mini course on, quote, poetry and persuasion to improve first year law students' writing and advocacy skills. Claudia Polsky. Greetings. Today I'll share a favorite poem by one of my favorite poets who also said one of my favorite things about the function of poetry, that it should look like a glass of water and act like gin. <laughs> my selection is by former British poet laureate and Andrew Motion, and it was prompted by the closure of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus after 146 years of operation, mostly due to animal rights complaints. Politically, I should have been happy. Personally, I was devastated. And into the gap between should feel and do feel lands this poem. The Dancing Hippo by Andrew Motion. In my country, we are not good to animals. A dog is a dog, however it might sit up and beg or run through a fire, and a bear riding a bicycle still wants to eat you. I think you can see from my lack of illusion that I have some experience. So when I tell you this story caused me distress, do not ignore me. It's difficult teaching a hippo to dance. It takes forever. They don't grow on trees, and buying one meant that our modest circus made do with a mothy lion for an extra year and sold two singing seals. Then when she arrived, our hippo, she ate like a creature possessed. And the shitting, continual diarrhea with her tail dithering, frantically spraying it everywhere. I have to admit I wanted her sold at once or turned into curio waste paper baskets. But Nikolai reckoned she'd learn Day after day, and sometimes night after night, we'd hear the dance of the sugar plum fairy with whip obligato, twittering out of his tent, and move, move, while he hopped around on the straw as if it were burning his feet. A hippo able to judge would certainly have thought he was mad, and so it may, I suppose, have been pity that led her to copy him, learning a ponderous sideways prance, a shuffling reverse, and a massive triumphant collapse, her curtsy. That's what it looked like, at least, the first time she danced for the public. The, on a summer night, in some one-horse place, we found, by chance, in the foothills, with warm, mosquito-y, hop-smelling air blowing under the rolled-up flaps, and the people, transfixed by the prance, reverse and collapse, that we thought was nothing, but seemed to them like a miracle. Maybe it was. For sure, everyone loved her, even when summer was over, and we returned to perform in our permanent home in the capital, where they are used to marvels. 
On opening night, under the stars in the park, she excelled herself in front of the president, rising at one time, I think, on her chubby back legs for a second. Afterwards, Nikolai said she was not for this world for long. And although he was right, his philosophy wasn't enough to prevent the fire that burst through her pen one night in the early new year and burnt her to death from breaking his heart. We live in a country where animals count for little, as I have said. But I remember him stumbling into my van after the flames were doused, and the huge carcass had gone wherever it went, gripping my arm, leaning close to my face in the yellow glare of my rickety kerosene lamp, and saying, I know it was useless, of course, her dancing. I know. But God above, it was beautiful. Beautiful. God. Or something like that. The Dancing Hippo by Andrew Motion. Thank you. Our next reader is Dr. Sid Reel, who's the Director of Staff Diversity Initiatives in UC Berkeley's Equity and Inclusion Division, where she leads campus D&I efforts for staff, including the NOW Conference, the Multicultural Education Program, and serves as the sponsor of eight identity-based campus staff organizations. She co-authored the book, The Diversity Calling, Building Community One Story at a Time, and she belongs to the Diversity Collegium Think Tank. She has an D from University of Southern California, a Master's of Education Administration from Harvard University, and a Bachelor's Degree in Sociology from Scripps College. Welcome, Dr. Sid Real. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was selecting a poem was remembering back to my K through 12 years. I was born and grew up in Berkeley, went to Berkeley High. Berkeley High was one of the first high schools in the country to have African-American history. And so I, when I was looking back, I remembered this poem from the 1930s Harlem poet Langston Hughes. And it's really remarkable, there's sort of a resurgence around him because in the Washington DC area, there's now this venue called Busboys and Poets at, that's named after him because he was a busboy who would take time off to read his poems or speak his poems. They're sometimes kind of long, so I took a few things out of it just to make sure we're okay. But for today, I'd like to read, Let America be America again. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Seeking a home where he himself is free. America was never free to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient, endless chain of profit, power, gain, and grab of land, of grab the gold, of grab the way of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. 
I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry, yet today, despite the dream. Beaten, yet today, oh, pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead. In every brick and stone, in every furrow turned, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung. The millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The street of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear that oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America great again. Thank you. There's a reason that poem doesn't fit on a baseball cap. <laughs> um, Elizabeth Wilcox, our next reader, is a senior consultant with human resources responsible for staff learning and development. This is her 30th year at UC Berkeley. Welcome, Elizabeth Wilcox. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for acknowledging the loss of John Ashbery this weekend. Um, there was another significant loss in the poetry world uh, this year, uh, and it was the death of Dennis Johnson in May. Um, when I read about his death, I, I read about it with very deep and personal sadness. Um, when I was in college, because we could not afford the book, my friends and I passed this bootleg copy of the Incognito Lounge around for more than a year. He just dazzled us. Um, I was the lucky one to hold on to this copy for 35 years now. Will Bly, the former editor of Esquire magazine and longtime friend, eulogized Dennis in this way. Battles never hardened Dennis. He never assumed a tough guy persona. His stories, fiction and nonfiction alike, exalt the innate dignity inherent in cowardice, in failure, in loserdom, in life at the bottom of the barrel. He seems to ask whether at some level cowardice might not be the same as love of life. Night by Dennis Johnson. I am looking out over the bay at sundown and getting lushed with a 59-year-old heavily rouged cocktail lounge singer, this total stranger. We watch the pitiful little ferry boats that ply between this world and that other one touched to flame by the sunset, talking with unmanageable excitement about the weather. The sky and huge waters turn vermilion as the cheap drink hour ends. We part with a grief as cutting as that line between water and air. I go downstairs and I go outside. It is like stepping into the wake of a tactless remark, the city's stupid chatter hurrying to cover up the shocked lull. 
The moon's mouth is moving, and I am just leaning forward to listen for the eventual terrible silence when he begins in the tones of a saddened, delinquent son, returned, unrecognizable, naming those things it now seems I might have done to have prevented his miserable life. I am desolate. What is happening to me? Thank you, Dennis. It reminds me of another Johnson line about night darkness. My name is D Dennis Johnson. Um, our last reader is Dr. Tarek Zodi, who received his PhD in 1997 in computational and applied mathematics from the University of Texas at Austin, and his habilitation in general mechanics from the Gottfried Leibniz University of Hanover, Germany in 2002. He is currently a chancellor's professor of mechanical engineering, chair of the computational and data science and engineering program at UC Berkeley, and holder of the W.C. Hall Family Endowed Chair in Engineering. Is that all? <laughs> His main research interests are in computational approaches for advanced manufacturing and 3D printing. So here to take us home, Dr. Tarek Zodi. OK, it's probably pretty weird for an engineer to read a poem, but this is a poem that uh, kept me going. I grew up in Louisiana, which was a pretty miserable place, and uh, this poem kept uh, me going. I read it ever since I was a child. It's called The Madman, or How I Became a Madman by Gibran Khalil Gibran, uh, who was the uh, author of The Prophet, which was a very popular book in the 1920s and since then. So he, he immigrated from what was then Syria before there was a Lebanon uh, from a small uh, village named Bashari. And of course, the Ottoman Empire was just about to collapse or was in the slow motion of collapse. And uh, there was a lot of turmoil. And so in 1895, he came here. So how I became, became a madman. You ask me how I became a madman. It happened thus. One day, before many gods were born, I, sp I woke from a deep sleep and found all my masks were stolen, the seven masks that I fashioned and worn in seven lives. I ran maskless through the crowded streets, shouting, thieves, thieves, the cursed thieves. Men and women laughed at me, and some ran to their houses in fear of me. And when I reached the marketplace, a youth standing on the top of the house cried, he is a madman. I looked up to behold him, and the sun kissed my own naked face for the first time. For the first time, the sun kissed my own naked face and my soul was inflamed with love for the sun, and I wanted my masks no more. And as if in a trance I cried, blessed, blessed are the thieves that stole my masks. Thus I became a madman, and I found freedom and safety in my madness. The freedom from loneliness, of loneliness actually, and the safety from being understood for those who understand us enslave something in us. Thank you. I want to thank all the readers for bringing their poets into this room. Please come back in October for Lely Long Soldier. And between now and next September, read some poetry, because some of you are going to get tapped next year. <laughs> Be well.